My wife is with me. She's uh, sitting with Ron and Carla Little, who are dear, dear friends of ours. I've been friends of ours 35, 37 years. Uh, their daughter Bethany went to Union, same age as our son Paul. And uh, my son's wife, Heather, is still best friends with Bethany. We go out and eat with them several times a year. So they are very, very, very precious friends to us. In fact, today is our anniversary. So I'm going <laughs> to... So I'm going to be on extra good behavior today. Uh, let us pray. Our Father God, we come God magnifying Jesus, exalting Jesus, lifting up the powerful, precious name of Jesus. And God, how I pray that you increase and we decrease. How I pray that you speak through me. How I pray that I preach with the attitude, the mind, the spirit of Jesus Christ. God, I pray this morning that we would see and experience a mighty movement of God. I pray your glory would fall like the dew on the grass. And God, you would open our eyes and we would see spiritually and open our ears that we might hear spiritually. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Beth Hamilton was 13 years old. She lived on the island of Kauai in Hawaii. And she was out surfing. A shark bit her arm off. She lost two thirds of her blood and many thought that she wouldn't even live. Well, she did live and within the month she was out surfing again. In fact, two years later, she won the national surfing competition. 18 years later today, she still goes around the world surfing and surfing competitions. She has uh, two children today, she's married. And here's what she wrote after the shark bit her arm off and I quote, I grew up in a Christian home. When the shark attack happened, I already knew that God had me in his care. I trusted that he had a plan and a reason for all of this. And so I said, hey God, I don't know why I lost my arm, but I am going to trust you and know that good can come from this situation. She's had two movies made about her life with a distinctively Christian slant. One is unstoppable, the other is so surfer. God transformed her setback into a comeback. And that's who God is. God is an expert at transforming our setbacks into comebacks. And one of the greatest comebacks in the Bible is where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. So I want to invite you today to take your Bible and turn with me to John chapter 11. And what we're gonna look at first in this chapter is the family's suffering. Martha, Mary, Lazarus, they're suffering. And so let's read verses one through four of John chapter 11. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sister sent word to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Lazarus is on his deathbed. So Martha and Mary send a messenger to where Jesus is. No one knows where Jesus is. We do know he is one day's journey away from Bethany. 
And the messenger says to Jesus, Jesus, will you please come heal Lazarus? Without a healing miracle, Lazarus is going to die. And Jesus lingers for two more days. And so I want you to read about his delay in verses 5 and 6. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he, were, he, he was. I want you to notice first the nearness of Jesus. Jesus was one day's journey away from Lazarus, yet Jesus was right there with Lazarus. He loves us, he cares for us, and he's always near. He's always near. It doesn't matter what we're going through, he's always with us. And that's why the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 37, who then shall separate us from the love of God through Jesus Christ? Shall tribulation or anguish or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Nay, in all of these, we're more than overcomers through him who loves us through Jesus Christ. Amen. For I am persuaded that neither life nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things to come, nor things present, nor any power or height or depth, nor anything at all of creation shall ever separate us from the love of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Maybe you're waiting on God today, like Lazarus was. Jesus lingered. For two days. This church is waiting for God to call you a pastor. God's lingering, waiting to answer your prayer. And it could be today, it could be you today are waiting for God to answer a prayer. It, it, it could be today, like Martha and Mary and Lazarus, you never needed God more than you need him today. And my friend, God loves you. If you're waiting on God, don't question his love. His love for you was settled at the cross. You can't do anything to make God love you more. You can't do anything to make God love you less. God love, regardless of what you're going through, God loves you and he is always near. Now, even though God loves us with an everlasting, sacrificial, unconditional love, that love does not shield us from the hearts, from the hurts and the heartaches and the problems and the diseases of this world, not even the death of a loved one. And even though Jesus loved Nazareth, that love did not shield him from a disease and even from death. Mary and Martha and Lazarus needed Jesus now. Without a healing miracle, Lazarus would have died. They needed Jesus Christ now. They never needed him more than they needed Jesus now. And what did he do? He lingered for two days. And again, it doesn't matter what we're going through as a church, as a family, as individuals. God loves us. He cares for us. And he's always near. It's 1958. The chairman of the Communist Party of China, Chairman Mao, said we have four pests in China and they all need to be eradicated. One was the sparrow. And so he ordered one day 
where all the Chinese in the nation of China would go outside and bang their pots and pans together because when sparrows flew and they heard pots and pans, they were paralyzed and they fell to the ground to their death. The Chinese did that. On that day, over one billion sparrows fell to their death. Well, that caused the ecological system to become imbalanced. And in 1958, China had the most severe famine in all of her history. Over 20 million Chinese died from starvation because, you see, the sparrows ate the insects. And without the sparrows, the ecological system became imbalanced. And there was a surge of insects. And they ate the crops and ruined the crops. And 20 million Chinese people died of a famine. That's how important the sparrow is to our ecological system. God says, even though he takes care of the sparrow, you and I are far more important to him than the sparrow. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 6, Jesus said, Are not five sparrows sold for two cents? Yet I tell you, not even one does God forget. Someone has well said that God attends the funeral of every sparrow. And how much more important are we than the sparrows? We should never doubt God's, regardless of what we're going through, never doubt God's love for us because he is always near. Henry Blackaby tells in his book, Experiencing God, about his daughter Carrie when she was 16 years old. She was diagnosed with cancer. And she went through harsh radiation and chemotherapy. And she suffered debilitating nausea and pain. She really suffered. And here's what Henry Blackaby says in Experiencing God. And I quote him. We never questioned God's love for us. At times as I prayed about Carrie, I would see that behind her and her illness stood the cross of Jesus Christ. I said, Father, don't ever let me look at my difficult circumstances and question your love for me. Your love was forever settled on the cross. God deal, he did miraculously heal Carrie, and she has two children and is a foreign missionary today. Secondly, I want you to look at the delay of Jesus Christ. He lingered for two days. Now, what do you think Martha and Mary thought? They sent a messenger, and Jesus did not come immediately. He delayed two days. What do you think they thought? Well, in John 11, verse 37, it says those lost Jewish mourners who were at the house of Martha and Mary they asked this question. Why did Jesus heal the blind man but would not heal Lazarus? Martha and Mary had to ask the question. Jesus, why did you heal others but you won't heal our brother? And you know, the scriptures already said Lazarus is the one Jesus loved. And so they surely had to ask Jesus if you really loved our brother, really, really loved our brother, why did you let him die? Why didn't you heal our brother? I mean, they even could have become angry. They, could have, they just could have thought, God, when we needed you the most, you didn't even show up. Uh, they, they may have been confused, thinking, Jesus, you're not the son of God we expected you to be. You didn't meet our expectations. I just wonder today how many of you can connect with Martha and Mary and Lazarus? How many of you can identify with Martha and Mary 
and Lazarus. I mean, they're waiting on Jesus to come heal their brother and Lazarus dies. And so I want to share with you this morning seven reasons why God puts us in his waiting room. Seven reasons why God doesn't answer our prayer when we want him to. Seven reasons why God doesn't work in our life when we want him to. Seven reasons why we have to wait on God. You're waiting on God to call a pastor to this church. Why? Why is God making you wait? Well, let me give you seven reasons. Reason number one, God makes us wait to show us that he is always working. God does not sleep, nor does he slumber. He works 24. He's always working. And so... Once we get through what we're waiting on, in hindsight, we look back. And when we think God was absent the most, we see that's when he was doing his greatest work. Now, number two, here's a second reason. Because God wants us to submit our will to his will. When we wait, we become desperate. And sometimes there's a sin that's keeping God from answering our prayer. Or there's a sin that's keeping God from working and moving in our lives. And in that waiting period, we become desperate. Finally, we address that sin and repent and forsake it. And then God answers the prayer. And then God moves. He's waiting for us to confess some sin in our life. Number three, God makes us wait because he wants all the glory. Not 95%, he wants all. He wants all the glory. Jesus told his disciples the death of Lazarus or the disease of Lazarus will not end into death but for the glory of God. Jesus wanted all the glory. So God causes us to wait in order that he gets all the glory and we give him the glory. Now, after two days, Jesus tells his disciples, it's time for us to go to Bethany and to heal Lazarus because Lazarus is asleep. And the disciples said, Jesus... If Lazarus is asleep, he'll recover. There's no need to go to Bethany. And Jesus responded, Lazarus is dead. Why did Jesus use the word sleep for death? Why do all the New Testament writers use the word sleep for death? The reason is sleep implies we're going to wake up. This afternoon... God willing, I'm going to take a Sunday afternoon nap. And the implication is I'm going to wake up and preach again at 5 o'clock here. Or if I go to bed, the implication is I'm going to get up in the morning. So we as believers go to sleep. That is, we die. Our spirit goes to heaven. Our body goes into the grave. And my friend, there's coming a day when the heavens are going to open and we're going to hear the voice of the archangel and the sound of the trump and Jesus is going to descend and we're going to wake up again from that grave and we're going to raise up and be caught up with Jesus in the air. So that's the reason Jesus and the writers substituted the word death for sleep. Now you may think, I don't know where I am, but I do. We're on reason number four. (laughs) Why is God making Kirby Woods wait? Why does God make us wait? It's to show us that we're living according to his calendar and not our calendar. We're on his timetable and not our timetable. We're marching to his drumbeat and not our drumbeat. Folks, time means nothing to God. God's not bound by time. But timing is everything to God. And timing is everything to us. 
And so God delays to show us that we're living according to his timing and not ours. Now, number five, he delays to show us that his delays are not his denials. His delays are not his denials. So when God delays, we've got to maintain hope. We've got to hold on to hope. And Romans 5 says that hope never disappoints. Jonah held on to hope when he was in the belly of the whale or the huge fish. Daniel held on to hope. And that hope didn't disappoint when he was in the lion's den. And so God delays. So we'll maintain hope. And then praise God that hope is finally realized. Now number six. There's a sixth reason. And the sixth reason is this. God delays to test our faith. To strengthen our faith. To purify our faith. And it draws closer to God. He delays to draw us closer to God. And I love that prayer. I think his name was Joe Cannon. Did I get the name right? Huh? Gary. I'm sorry, Gary. But I loved his prayer. Make us more like Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, God delays to test our faith to draw us closer to Jesus and to make us more like Jesus. Now, number seven, here's the seventh reason God delays, because he wants to give us something better. God wants to bring a better pastor to your church and maybe what you're thinking about or wishing for. Let me ask you a question, which was better? Jesus Jesus healing Lazarus from the disease or Jesus Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead? Uh Uh-huh. Far better for Jesus to raise Lazarus from the dead than the healing from the disease. So another reason God delays is to give us something better. Well, we've looked at the family's suffering. Let's look at the family's sorrow. Verses 20 through 27. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. For Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes on me shall live even if he dies and he who lives and believes on me shall never die. Martha, do you believe that? And Martha said, yes, Lord. I know you're Christ, the son of the living God. Even he who has come into the world, my friend, the resurrection is not an event. The resurrection is Jesus. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. Martha goes out to meet Jesus. He's coming back from Bethany. and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus said, Martha, he'll rise again. She went back home. Mary and the mourners went out to meet Jesus, just like Martha. Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. So how do we connect? How do we identify? How how do we make application? Lazarus is in the tomb, dead end. Martha and Mary grieved and suffering. Well, Well, let me share with you. We may be like Martha and Mary and Lazarus if we've lost a loved one. Or if we're struggling with an addiction or struggling with a sin, a stronghold of sin, and it's defeating us. Or maybe, particularly if you're a Sunday school teacher, and the hurts and the problems of your members in your class are being heaped and dumped on you. I've known two or three preachers in my 40 years that resigned. They just couldn't handle all the hurts and the sufferings of the people They were teaching. 
And so it could be your family, could be friends, could be friends and family just dumping hurts and problems on you and just over your head like Martha and Mary trying to deal with the disease and the death of Lazarus. Or it, it could be we can identify if we're out of a job or if our dream has died. Or, or we can identify if, if when we need God, when we need him the most, he's been absent. Or, or we can identify, remember Lazarus is in a tomb now, dead. And so if someone is lying about us, someone is opposing us, someone is rejecting us, someone is slandering our character and our reputation, someone is stabbing us in the back, that's, that's a dead end. Or it could be, it could be your heart's hemorrhaging today because of some past shame, some past regret, some past sin, and you haven't forgiven yourself over. Or we're with Martha and Mary if our child's rebelling against God and rebelling against us, or our grandchild is rebelling against God or rebelling against us. So the tombs in our lives are the empty places in our hearts where defeat reigns and failure rules, but praise God, those same tombs are the places where transformation begins where resurrection occurs. And so that leads us to the third point. Number one, not only the suffering of the family, not only the sorrow of the family, but I want you to see the Savior of the family. First of all, Jesus' compassion, verses 33 through 35. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came after her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. The tears of Jesus revealed his tender heart. He was touched by the grief and the suffering and the hurt of Martha and Mary and those Jewish mourners. He took their hurt upon himself. And my friends, God steps into the arena of our suffering. He, he cries with us. Jesus is in every teardrop. He understands what we're going through and he feels what we feel. The renowned Swiss theologian Karl Barth, 1962, spoke at the University of Chicago. He lectured. After his lecture, a student asked him, Dr. Barth, can you put all of your theology in one sentence? And he thought for a moment. He said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. You, you see, the same sun that holds the planets in orbit is the same sun that ripens the tomatoes in your garden as if it had nothing else to do. And in the same way, God who created the universe cares for us as if he has nothing else to do. And that's the reason Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 7, cast your cares, cast your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. He cares for you. But not only his compassion, I want you to see his command. Verses 39 through 46, Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench. Now the Egyptians he bombed, but the Jews didn't. And there was going to be a horrible stench. For he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe, you'll see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe that you sent me. 
When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw that he had done believed in him, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. So here Lazarus is wrapped up like a mummy. And Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth out of that grave. And then Jesus says to the friends, you unwrap him. Lazarus could not unwrap himself. And so Jesus says to his friends, you do for Lazarus what he cannot do for himself. And that's the reason every Christian without exception needs to be in a small group Bible study. People who love the Lord. People who can do for each other what they can't do for themselves. To reach out to one another, to support each other, to affirm each other, to encourage each other. To cry with each other, weep with each other, rejoice with each other, praise, adore, and worship the Lord together. Going on six years, we've had a small group like that meets in our house. Our Sunday night attendance tripled when we went into the homes. We study the Word of God, we eat, and we pray 30, 45 minutes every Sunday night. We pray together. My friend, every Christian needs a weekly study to be around other Christians who can do for him what he can't do for himself and for him to do for others what they cannot do for themselves. Now, verse 45 says this. Verse 45 says, many Jews believed. When Lazarus was raised from the grave, many Jews got saved. You know, the greatest miracle is salvation. The young man being baptized today because that's the greatest miracle. Amen. You know, when you lead a non-Christian to faith in Christ, you raise that person out of death into life. You raise that person out of darkness into the marvelous light. You raise that person out of hell into heaven. You don't do it. God does it. That's the greatest miracle. And in John 14, 12, Jesus, Jesus said, greater miracles will you do than I did. What's the only miracle that's greater than the miracles Jesus did? It's leading a non-Christian to faith in Christ. And the question is, when are we going to start doing that? Number one, when we love lost people like Jesus did. Jesus cried and wept with those lost Jewish mourners, not just Martha and Mary. When we love lost people like Jesus, number two, when we get filled with the Holy Spirit, then we become his witnesses. So, let me ask you today, you need victory today? You need God to raise you up today? Maybe you're feeling defeated, discouraged. Maybe you feel like a failure. You need victory. Maybe you're in an impossible situation and you need victory today. Or, could be you need God to open a door for you. God, we really need for you to open a door for my family or for me. Or it could be you need delivering today. You just need, could be you need vindication. In the Psalms, many times the psalmist prayed for God to vindicate him. Or it just could mean today that you need a prayer answered. Or it could mean today that you need, as we've already sung today, for God to turn your tomb into a garden. It could mean that you need wisdom today. You need direction today. It could be you're confused and you need God to bring clarity out of your confusion. And so I want to suggest two things. Number one, to pray this prayer, to pray for God to fill you with his love and his power and his presence and his peace. For God to fill you with his love, power, presence, and peace. And God's love, power, presence, and peace just to flow through you. That's, that's number one. Number two, I want you to claim two promises. Number one, Romans 8, 37, and all these things. And all these things, the scripture says, we're more than conquerors. We're overcomers through him 
who loves us. And so, God, you make me the overcomer. You make me the conqueror. You call me to be. And then number two, James 4.10. Humble yourself in the presence of God, and he will exalt you. Humble yourself in the presence of God, and he will raise you up. Let us pray. Our Father God, we continue to exalt and magnify Jesus. And God, we pray that your resurrection power would be manifested among us today. God, I pray that you would call someone's setback to be a comeback today. God, I pray that today would be a day that a person would confront a sin that's keeping you from working in his life or answering a prayer. And that person would deal with that sin, repent, and forsake it today. God, I pray that today will be the day of salvation for someone this morning. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. We're getting ready to have an invitation. This is biblical. It's the way they did it in the Bible. Jesus said, if you'll confess me before men, then I'll confess you before my Father. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 12, he said, make a great confession in front of many witnesses. Confess Jesus in front of many witnesses. In the Bible, when people were saved, it was in front of crowds and multitudes. So that's the reason for the invitation today. You want to know that when you die, you're going to heaven. You want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt you're saved. You've got to repent. Tell God you're a sinner. Ask him to forgive you for your sins. And when you do that, He'll cleanse you from every sin. He'll make you whiter than snow. And he'll impart his righteousness on you. And then you trust Christ. You receive Christ as your Savior. You make him the Lord of your life. Romans 10, 9 says, If you will confess Jesus Christ with your mouth as Lord, then you will be saved. And so there'll be two deacons down here, I understand. And as God leads you today, listen, it's a joy. It's a privilege. It's a wonderful opportunity to come today and confess Jesus as your Savior and Lord before people who love you and who support you. And then I want to invite you to come today and to join the fellowship of this church. I want to tell you folks, I've known this church for 35 years and this church has a great, great future. I know that from head to toe with all of my heart. This church has a great, great future and it could be God's calling you today to be a part of what God's doing and what God's going to do in this church. If so if God leads, you come and just say, I want to join the fellowship. I want to get in on what God's doing here at Kirby Woods and what God is going to do. And then number three, here's the third. This altar is open. And somehow, some way, you feel an urge, maybe an urgency to come and pray. You don't know why. You just feel the Holy Spirit. Obey the Holy Spirit. Obey the Holy Spirit. Let's stand. You come as God leads.